Well, top of the morning to you. Today, you might have guessed by the title of this video and the fact that I'm wearing the color green that we're going to be discussing Celtic mythology and ancient Irish mysticism. This is a topic I have always been interested in since I was uh, a wee lad, you know, hearing all the, the various fairy tales by Andrew Lang and, and various stories of ancient Ireland and the, the, the wee people and the leprechauns and fairies. Uh, you know, growing up, uh, we had always watched the Walt Disney movie Darby O'Gill and the Little People, which was the first Technicolor movie put out by Walt Disney, and it had had Sean Connery in it and featured King Brian of Nocknashiga in the ruins of Nocknashiga and it had the Banshee I remember always being afraid when the, the death coach came up and every Irish family was said to have a Banshee that was associated with it but most certainly uh, I, I love the fact that they have the fairy mount and, and they show uh, the the original Stradivarius that was there that the, the little people loved dancing and, and the fiddle being played and how King Brian was always playing tricks with Darby O'Gill and all of the old Irish legends that were sort of preserved in these stories. And my fascination with these stories kept going even in my youth. I remember when I was 16, driving out in the middle of nowhere on Samhain on this uh, very foggy, uh, very foggy day. This was during Halloween and I was drawn out to a metaphysical bookstore that had a, 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 let, a newsletter that was published by a, a shamanic Celtic teacher who had just moved into the area and when I had picked this thing up it was almost as if I was meant to find it and she took me under uh, her wing as an apprentice and I remember taking her courses and reading her materials and doing these shamanic journeys and studying the symbols and words and associations to take journeys into the Celtic other world and I've just always loved Celtic music uh, most certainly you know the the harp the fiddle all of the old songs and poems so i want to discuss many of those concepts with all of you today and why they're so beautiful why ancient ireland is so important uh, as it gives us clues into civilization but perhaps nothing had excited my imagination more other than the idea of fairies leprechauns elves sylphs salamanders gnomes undines those who were the rulers of the nature kingdoms, the elementals, the rulers of the mineral kingdoms. And you get a really great idea of them when you pick up some of this old literature. I'm going to read uh, a passageway to me for all of you that is called The Stolen Child out of the uh, writing of William Butler Yeats, who was uh, an incredible writer and contributor of the 20th century, one of my favorites. And uh, this, this passageway was also turned into a song by the great Lorena McKennett in 1985 on her Elemental album, which is fantastic. I've always loved Lorena McKennett. So I'm going to read this for all of you. Where dips the rocky highland of sleuth wood in the lake, there lies a leafy island where flapping herons wake. The drowsy water rats, there we've hid our fairy vats full of berries and of reddest stolen cherries. Come away, O oh human child, to the waters and the wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. Where the wave of moonlight glosses, the dim gray sands with light, far off by further rosses, we foot it all the night. Weaving olden dances, mingling hands and mingling glances, till the moon has taken flight, to and fro we leap and chase the frothy bubbles while well, the world is full of troubles and anxious in its sleep. Come away, O oh human child, to the waters and the wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand, where the wandering water gushes from the hills above Glencar in pools among the rushes that scarce could bathe a star. We seek for slumbering trout and whispering in their ears, give them unquiet dreams, leaning softly out. From ferns that drop their tears over the young streams, come away, O oh human child, to the waters and the wild. With a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. Away with us he's going, the solemn-eyed, he'll hear no more the lowing, 
for the calves on the warm hillside, or the kettle on the hob, sing peace into his breast, or see the brown mice bob, round and round the oatmeal chest, for he comes, the human child, to the waters and the wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than he can understand. And we see many other incredible writings that had to do with fairies and these great beings. Uh, I have so many here, Irish fairy and folk tales. Uh, and uh, of course, I was just reading from Yeats and, and you can see the Celtic Twilight and many other wonderful books. Uh, over here, we had the work of the great uh, Reverend Kirk who took the uh, topic of fairies very seriously and wrote about them uh, as many authors in his time had and investigated these topics thoroughly. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of Irish writers. There's something very interesting and wonderful and special about the Irish people as linguists, as writers, as uh, having these great abilities. And I'm going to talk about that very uh, briefly in a moment here. But, uh, you know, we, we learn about Oscar Wilde and one of my favorite Osh Irish writers, James Joyce, uh, wrote Finnegan's Wake. If you ever want a tongue twister book that's going to bend your mind, read this book, Finnegan's Wake. I mean, this guy took 20 years to write books. He was an absolute brilliant genius when it came to writing. Uh, just absolutely incredible. Uh, another work that you guys might want to check out if you're interested in the topic of fairies, uh, check out The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, uh, and this is by Dr. Evan Wentz. And what's very interesting about this particular edition is that it had a foreword by the great Terence McKenna. Uh, now, many of you uh, probably already know about Terence McKenna, and if you followed his work, you'll know that he was obsessed with elves and fairies and machine elves, especially that he saw during his DMT psychedelic experiences. And so, uh, as a, a scholar, he was very much interested in this work. Uh, what's very interesting about uh, Wentz is that he actually had written a foreword himself for the work of Paramahansa Yoganda in Diary of a Yogi. If many of you have read that book out there, I'm sure you have. Uh, very interesting stuff, taking the fairy faith very seriously uh, over in Ireland. And we have different ideas about who these beings uh, were. Of course, I mentioned, you know, the elemental kingdoms and where they could have come from with that. But of course, there's also a very interesting similarity to fairy encounters and that which we hear about when someone describes a UFO encounter. The, the fairy tales always describe an interdimensional portal that would open up in these fairy rings where the fairies have been dancing all night long and many of us have seen what they call colloquially fairy rings where we see mushrooms gathered out in a circle or the grass has been trodden down. Others say that's a natural phenomena that happens underground with mycelium and other things. But when we look at the fairy phenomena such as the story of Llewellyn and Rhys and ancient Ireland where you know the, the, there was music heard and dancing and then a friend would go missing uh, you know this concept of missing time and uh, as you hear about in the Yeats uh, poem we see that this child that would go missing into the fairy world and come back sounds very similar to the UFO encounters and there's actually a place called the E. Seti Ranch in Washington State that is run by a fellow named James Gillian. You can look this up. And many people come there because it's almost like uh, an interdimensional vortex or a, pa a portal that goes to another dimension. Or people have taken photographs of UFOs there and captured fairies on film, which is absolutely incredible. And many have different ideas about where the fairy beings came from and who they were. Uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned, there's an idea that they're associated with nature spirits and elementals. This idea of elemental beings goes back even before the time of the great Babylonian king Sargon in 3800 BC. Uh, for example, uh, we know that the ancient symbol of the, the philosophers, those who are wise, was fire coming out of water. Uh, or, you know, everything creating, being created from fire or water. And it was believed there were sort of elemental rulers. Uh, and, and who are we to say that we understand all the laws of the universe and the mechanism behind the elements, behind the, the sources of, you know, nature and uh, what works behind the scenes on a multi-dimensional level? 
Now there's a few places we have to look at for the origins of the fairy faith in Ireland. Some believe that these beings, the fairies and the leprechauns, the sylphs, the salamanders, the undines, the gnomes, all of them came in from a battle that took place in the heavens. That they were in, caught right down the middle of the battle between Michael the Archangel and the devil. And they were not good enough to be in heaven, but not bad enough to be in hell. So they were allowed to live on the Emerald Isle. And uh, we see all sorts of different theories in the field guide to... Uh, fairies, fallen angels, and other subversive spirits. Uh, and the more popular theory that comes back from folklorists and mythologists is caught up in the very complex history of Ireland, which is very interesting to say the least. As many of you already know, that Ireland is just part of what is known as the Celtic peoples. And when we look at that, uh, the Celts are broken up into those in Scotland, Ireland, parts of the British Isles, Brittany and France. And this was long before we get the concept of how things were broken up in the ancient world with the expansion of the Germanic and Slavic tribes. Uh, you know, this, these peoples uh, were very special onto their own. They spoke Gaelic, they didn't have a written language. But what happens is that we learn about the arrival of the people of the goddess Danu, the Tuatha de Danann, that arrived in flying ships into ancient Ireland. And these beings were mysterious to say the least. They came from the mysterious place of Turnanog, Avalon, otherwise known as the Shining Country. And as they came, some speculate that they were actually the ancient Atlanteans. Others have various theories about who they were, but they were said to bring all sorts of myst mystical traditions with them. And the great beings that arrive with them are very similar to all the other gods and goddesses from other polytheistic traditions that show up, including to the Norse and the Greek mythologies, the Roman mythologies. It's very interesting that there is a set of characters that all have specific archetypes, but they are said to have brought in with them these different fairies and leprechauns and beings and they were said to be very tall and because of their influence they passed on uh, these genetics when they were there of the uh, fair features and the reddish lighter hair and they, they brought in all sorts of different music and, and instruments and influences and Irish people have the harp which is said to be attuned with the perfect Hertzian frequency of the music of the spheres or the planets we also see a connection here with the ancient Pythagoreans that taught these principles another interesting uh, corollary here is that we learn about King David in the Bible playing the harp and many scholars have speculated that the Tuatha de Danann, or the people of the goddess Danu, could be related to one of the lost tribes of Israel. And keep in mind that Israel, it really stands for Isis, Ra, and El, and is connected to the ancient Egyptians. But with this particular uh, connection, the theory is, is that they belong to the tribe of Dan. And we see other connections that are very interesting all throughout this Celtic history when we look at the connection uh, with the invasion of the Danes uh, and Denmark being involved because we know Denmark used to be Danmark and then we have the tribe of Dan uh, and the Tuatha de Danann uh, and most famously we know about the great Irish king Brian Boru that drove out the Danes which is very exciting now before we leave the topic of the fairy faith I'd actually like to talk about a couple more things to do with it. Uh, most certainly, there have been many great books over the years that talk about the various traditions. One of my favorites was uh, is by the great Ted Andrews. Ted Andrews wrote about uh, a book called Enchantment of the Fairy Realm, which is available out on Llewellyn Publishing. And he wrote about all the traditions of, of those who are mystics that work with fairies and understanding the elemental kingdoms. Uh, and he describes the various techniques uh, that those out there have used to communicate with fairies. Traditionally, uh, you know, there was ideas of covering one eye, uh, or you could only see a fairy when you had done so by uh, it during a tween time or a tween place. And what a tween place was is that you could go out in nature, out in the woods or uh, an area such as, um, you know, a, a bubbling stream or uh, out, out by the ocean when the water is coming in between or the tide is coming up and it's in that in-between place or out in the middle of a bridge, something that's neither up nor down. But the idea was that if you look through some... Uh, 
uh, branches that are out in the woods that this would sort of open up like a glitch in the matrix or something that you could perceive uh, an interdimensional reality which is very interesting there are other traditions that we find in this very faith such as the idea that there uh, every forest has what is known as a white lady or a guardian and these these fairies they would be in all sorts of different areas there's fairies inside of rocks uh, and there's every tree had a tree spirit or a dagda uh, which is absolutely incredible I, I think it's fascinating and uh, remarkable that these traditions have existed for so long and we we learn about other uh, you know new age and spiritual mystical writers such as Eden McCoy uh, that has written about uh, the, the traditions of fairy Wicca being influenced by witchcraft coming out of the British Isles uh, and mysticism that the fairies didn't like to use metal or uh, athames made of metal they only like stone uh, and uh, they, you know they most certainly uh, are afraid of cats uh, going after them or seeing them so there's various little traditions like that that they hold true um, but you know there there's still stories in Ireland to this day that I keep hearing about uh, from people who still experience them that they they have encounters with them over in uh, at the hill of Tara and other places and why Ireland is supposed to be very special for this it is it said when the Tuatha de Danann were uh, uh, driven out of Ireland uh, you know and there was uh, this you know this changeover with the fairies is that they the the veils were not so thin so that the fairies and these great beings went un underground and they disappeared now when most people think of Ireland they think of the shamrock the four-leaf clover being lucky they think of St. Patrick's Day who drove out the snakes and many are quick to criticize St. Patrick and saying that he was against pagans and pagans by the way were just country folk that uh, you know uh, served nature spirits and, and the elementals and preserve nature and these beings uh, and there's nothing wrong with being pagan per se but you know even though St. Patrick was said to have driven out all the snakes of the pagans out of Ireland obviously he never succeeded so there's no reason to hold a grudge against him uh, but we can't talk about all these topics without bringing up the Druids the Druids were most certainly a magical class of people that uh, wore these white robes that could have influences to stop great kings from battling that uh, were attuned to the mysteries no doubt perhaps even attuned from the ancient Atlanteans or as some have suggested maybe their teachings came from India or the Phoenicians or some other area either way it's absolutely fascinating and because the Celtic peoples didn't have a written language per se but used Gaelic uh, storytelling and other means of art to preserve their traditions we do know they had Ogams very similar to the story of Odin and the the runes that we get from Norse traditions the Ogams were a tree alphabet that came from the Druids and most certainly many trees were sacred to them for holding energy and having certain properties some of them were oak uh, the oak tree uh, the ash hawthorn uh, elder tree many of these uh, were said to hold a, a very specific energy uh, the holly uh, had a certain type of magnetism or they could magnetize it and use it within particular rituals which is fascinating uh, these ogams are even mentioned in some of these books I have uh, on the desk as you see that these uh, the ogam alphabet was divided up into three different areas uh, based on the classes uh, of the of the druids uh, but this book over here uh, again is written by DJ Conway and it's on Celtic magic and has all sorts of traditions in, in uh, break off practices and uh, uh, it's a, a wonderful little guide to bringing out a form of Celtic magic uh, and we see this in other books and other traditions as well this one is called Celtic myth and magic by Eden McCoy and going into exploring some of the Celtic pantheon and traditions and where that all uh, came together but again one of the topics that has always fascinated me about this Celtic and Irish mysticism is the idea of Celtic shamanism now when we think of a shaman we often think of a medicine woman or medicine man uh, storyteller that existed in you know Native American tribes or uh, Aboriginal groups in the Amazon but this is actually a Siberian term and the Celtic peoples 
uh, definitely had shamans. These shamans, we can see traces of them in their, their roots and depicted in art. And we know that these uh, practices, these spiritual abilities uh, to uh, bring other ideas from the other world and, and medicine and concepts to people were very real. This is covered in the work of John and Caitlin Matthews, who have researched this extensively. In fact, uh, in other books we see, like By Oak, Ash, and Thorn by DJ Conway, she talks about Celtic shamanism. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, this is a topic I have uh, studied and looked into sort of the modern practices of it. I, I'm not sure what it, what we call uh, neo -Druid, druidism or modern druidism is similar to the ancient druidism but i think that what we draw from this these practices of shamanism is very interesting because we get this idea of uh the walker between worlds that would go into the other world and and bring back uh medicine and ideas and uh, you know communications from relatives that have crossed over and in the concepts of the other world We learn about something known as the world tree and in the world tree It's sort of like the tree of life that we get from the Kabbalah But in the Celtic world tree you basically have three entrances so we could go underneath the world tree into the underworld which is sort of like your summer land where relatives and ancestors would live uh, and it's sort of a very peaceful serene place we have the middle world that you'd go through which would take us into sort of an astral overlay of our world then the shining country or the upper world that you would enter where the divas and the gods would exist that you could get great communications and divine inspirations from uh, and these these are where great gifts would come from as well that would be given to the shaman or the medicine person or a great inspiration uh, and these wonderful, wonderful teachings of shamanism, be able to meditate or go to the other world, are truly fantastic. In fact, over the years, I've greatly enjoyed the journey index that have come out by John and Caitlin Matthews, uh, where they have made cards that allow you to shuffle up various uh, scenarios on these cards that can be used for divination as well, but essentially the cards are used to take a Celtic shamanic journey. So as you would take out the journey, it would tell you if you're going to the underworld, the middle world, uh, the upper world, uh, if there is a Celtic god or goddess that you needed to speak to or, or what the uh, inspiration that you're getting from this particular uh, journey is meant to be and they used various Celtic symbolism on them they're they're absolutely wonderful and I urge you to check them out and for many years you were you weren't able to get these because they had gone out of print I still have the originals here uh, that have you been using for a very long time uh, and I've had to reorder them before as well but uh, they also have a new edition of the deck it is slightly different it's called the Celtic shamans pack very neat uh, it's absolutely wonderful, and there are many Celtic shaman groups that you can find out there that do drumming circles that, uh, that bring out these old Celtic traditions, which is truly wonderful. Now, Celtic shamans greatly uh, draw on this ancient uh, mysticism and spirituality, and there are many Celtic Wiccans, Celtic witches, uh, and there are those who uh, call themselves Neo-Druids. Uh, that are reviving what they believe that they discovered from the ancient druids and uh, but uh, many uh, look to these polytheistic gods to have attributes uh, that they can look to uh, and and serve for, uh, for the teachings uh, one of those most famously is no has been known as Kernunos who is the hunter, protector, god of fertility, god of the forest, uh, that he is associated with Pan, uh, you know, and he's got the, the horns on his head. Uh, so, not, not to be confused with the idea that we have of the devil, by the way, uh, but the picture that we have to look at is from the Gunstrip Cauldron. Uh, this, this picture I'm showing you guys right here, I'm, I'm going to try to hold it up so everybody can see it. It basically comes from the Gunstrip Cauldron, which is believed to be dated around 200 BC to 300 AD. Uh, and it's essentially what we would probably think of as coming out of the early Roman Iron Age. And when we look at it here, it was actually discovered uh, in Denmark, and it's actually over in the museum uh, in Denmark and Copenhagen. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, Denmark became 
uh, or Denmark it became Denmark uh, and it's associated with the Danes uh, so there there's no doubt that due to the symbology on here the Gaulish symbology and the depictions that this is this is connected to the Celts uh, and it, it probably was moved there at some point point. and when it was discovered it was it found in a peat bog around 1891 but what's very interesting about this picture that we see is that on the right side here you'll see that he's holding a snake which shows you know the embracing of wisdom that many see this as and on the left side he's holding the infinite sign of uh, immortality uh, of the infinite uh, no there's no doubt that when we look at how his legs are crossed there is a connection to being uh, in a state of meditation of journeying with his eyes closed into the the other worlds many will associate this uh, depiction on the gunstrip cauldron as being Kernunos the god of shamanism uh, of Celtic shamanism uh, and, and and we also see that again on the artwork uh, that even that is depicted here of Kernunos by Oak Ash and Thorn and another fascinating connection that was made with Kernunos was pointed out to me by an Irish writer friend of mine, David Halpin, who's written several articles on this topic, who he believes that there is a connection to the Indian Brahmin or Brahma uh, and the, the Vedic influences coming into Ireland and there, there being a connection to Buddhism, especially with this depiction, uh, which I am always interested in to all and looking into all these other uh, connections. So, I am also interested in looking at the ancient astrological calendars that we see in Ireland in the in the various runes. There's a connection to the ancient Egyptians coming there. Uh, there's a connection to Toth, Hermes Trismegistus. Uh, there's so much there to look at. And if you guys want to find out more about the history of Ireland, I highly recommend you look up the work of the great Michael Tazarian. He has written extensively about the ancient Irish origins of civilization, and he did something uh, like a nine-hour lecture in his brilliant fashion that he always does, uh, just, just throwing facts at you one after the other that are all truly mind-blowing. So uh, over this next one-month period, we are going to be investigating the mysteries of the British Isles, Irish mysticism, and a whole lot more. Uh, including talking to Irish folklorists and finding out if the fairy faith and belief in the little people still exists over there. So stay tuned for more videos. Thank you so much for watching.